everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to be here um, talking about autonomous vehicles. And I, like I'm sure many of you, have a passion for cars. Uh, I've got a, a 1973 MGB GT, which I've owned for the last 14 years. I love the fact that it's in some ways not connected uh, through the handling and the smell and the sound that it makes. Uh, I've also recently become a father. So it struck me the other day that actually when my daughter's old enough to drive, her way of driving may just be to use her smartphone to sort of summon a, a CAV, a Connected Autonomous Vehicle, to come and collect her. So the role of the dad taxi may be limited. Back in 2013, I was part of a, a sort of an internal startup team at Jaguar Land Rover, uh, where I, was, I helped them to, to launch their first suite of connected car products known as In Control. It was during my time with Jaguar Land Rover that, I, to my surprise, I'd found out that connected vehicles had actually been with us for quite a long time. Back in 1996, General Motors had actually launched their uh, GM OnStar product. But it's really been in the last few years that we've really seen the pace of change accelerating um, with, the, with the arrival of connected cars. Today, we've got many auto automotive giants uh, developing autonomous vehicles. Uh, we've also got the likes of Tesla and some other disruptors coming into the space, such as Google, Faraday Future, and the uh, Apple car, and maybe even Dyson with their local announce recent announcement of their electric vehicle. On top of that, our cars can actually do a lot for us already today. The lights come on automatically. The wipers come on automatically when, when it's raining. Um, we can connect to them with our smartphones. They can tell the emergency services once we've had an accident. However, we find ourselves still in the driving seat doing the driving. CAVs, they, they promise a, a fantastic future. They, they promise a future of us being the passengers, being able to sort of call, call, them, up, call them at will, if you like, to uh, pick us up and drop us off where we'd like to be. And in theory, uh, our roads and our journeys will become safer, more efficient through sort of optimal route planning, greener with the, uh, with the uh, arrival of electric vehicles as well, and freer. So whether that means we're going to be watching more YouTube videos or working even more, who knows. Um, but we'll have more time to ourselves. This all sounds great, um, but really what we need to understand is how long this is going to take. So what I'd like to do is I've got to have a video to share with you to give a bit more of a feel for what I'm going to talk about today. Much hype exists around driverless cars. Daily reports of new car launches keep us in anticipation. When will we be able to try this innovative new mode of transport? Autonomous technology is not part of some imagined future scene. It's happening today. But what needs to happen beyond technology to make this possible? Our research shows that autonomous vehicles are at least 10 years away and require each player in a complex roads network to work together so who needs to be involved? Highways authorities need to upgrade our roads. We need to develop the right communications and systems. Law enforcement needs to make sure we're safe. Governments need new laws for the roads and the data. Insurers need to know who is liable. Automotive manufacturers must share their vision. And regulators need to work together with industry. Autonomous vehicles are the future, but we need to address the roadblocks in their way. PA, we make the difference. Okay, so almost every week we seem to hear of some, something happening in the autonomous world uh, with connected vehicles. They're on our TVs, social media, uh, in the newspapers, and we even have some on our roads in some pilot projects. In particular, we hear a lot about what's happening in the US with the likes of Tesla, Google, but also uh, other, other countries also forging ahead as well, like Sweden, uh, Gothenburg, for example, Volvo are, are fairly active, and also Scania. They'd like to re release a connected truck capability by 2020. Uh, so it's good, it's good to know that we're also on this path. Uh, we, we have quite a few 
pilot projects going ourselves. We've got uh, the catapult uh, activities in Milton Keynes. We've got the gateway projects happening in, in Greenwich. Uh, we've also got the uh, Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, and also recently the Meridian project, which is going to help us really to forge ahead with connected vehicles on motorways. However, it, it feels that we should more, be more in the front seat leading rather than just uh, than following. So, to get an understanding for how far down the road uh, CAVs in the UK are, uh, we've spoken to a, a whole host of different parties across the whole automotive ecosystem. So we've spoken to insurance companies, uh, law firms, uh, automotive uh, OEMs, the police, uh, engineering firms, and also uh, government. And the main, the main uh, challenge, as it were, is that typically it seems that everybody needs to be ready at the same time. And that's difficult, especially with, with such a vast and wide uh, topic such as this. So, for example, the Highways Authority, they need to be able to adapt local uh, city infrastructure, uh, at, also at a, at a local level in, in villages or in country roads. There needs to be a, a huge amount of collaboration with manufacturers. At the moment, BMWs don't even speak to other BMWs, so getting, getting other cars to talk to each other and to the local environment is going to take a lot of collaboration, and, and, the, and the vehicles will probably need to speak the same language. Uh, they're also going to have to manage the, the limbo state, the, the point in time where we're going to have some autonomous vehicles and some conventional vehicles on the roads. So again, that, that's also going to have to be managed. And so what we've done at PA, we've, we've interviewed a panel of, our, of experts, and they typically believe that it's going to take, on average, 10 years before the highways authority in the, in the UK are ready to, to have a, a seamless autonomous vehicle experience. Obviously, it could take a lot longer than that, uh, and I'm sure it might do, given the, the faces of the challenges that have to be overcome. But at the moment, uh, this is what the panel is saying. The next one, uh, communication and system providers. Um, as we've heard from uh, some other speakers already this morning, uh, consumers are going to expect new choices and outcomes from their mobility providers. The, the communications and systems providers are going to have to have their in infrastructure in place to handle a hell of a lot more de uh, data. If you imagine every sort of connected autonomous vehicle is like having a, a mobile phone, but times 10, the, the infrastructure is going to need to be there to have both the coverage and also the speed of, of the uh, access to the data. And also, along with that, based on my experience uh, launching with Jaguar Land Rover, what happens when you're in a tunnel? What happens if you're in a, an underground car park or, or, or such instances like that? They all have to be thought of and taken into account. Because of that, our panel believe it's around 13 years before the comms uh, communications providers are ready. Then we have law. Regulations are going to need to change. Also, criminal use of uh, CAVs are also going to be, need to be taken into account. And ideally prevented, um, obviously with the data security that comes into play. Um, but, but there's going to be other elements like who's going to be um, liable for traffic offences because there, there may be mistakes, cars may park in the wrong place and who, who's going to be responsible for moving them or who's responsible for, for where that car is. There's also the element of uh, how to prove that a vehicle's been overridden by a user. So to, and to lock someone in their vehicle or to send that vehicle on an alternative route that, they hadn't, that the occupant hadn't envisaged. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration and also enforced, because that's the tough bit. Um, so the panel, panel believe it's 10 years for that to come to reality. Next up, we have the, the government and policy makers. Um, and from uh, what Alan said this morning, we've already made huge inroads into this. But really, going forward, we need a, a real coordinated strategy to, to continue to shape standards. As I mentioned earlier, we should really be seen as leaders in this space. We've got great minds in this country and a, and a great uh, heritage for automotive uh, technology. We also need to make sure that the government puts in place uh, safeguards against rigged tests. We don't want uh, CAVs on the road that seem safe but aren't. 
and I'm sure we're all aware of the, the fairly recent Volkswagen emissions scandal. So preventing that, that type of uh, scandal in the future is important. So again, our panel suggests it's about 10 years before the government in the UK will be ready. Uh, now we come on to the insurers. So uh, in some ways they've got the tricky job. Um, our panel say it's eight years before they're ready. And I guess you, you've got to think, if you're, an, if you're an occupant of an autonomous vehicle and you, you're in an accident, who would you go to for compensation? Who's liable? Where does the responsibility lie? So there's a whole host of different things that need to be thought of here. Then there's also having to be able to price for different insurance types, whether it's based on vehicle type, uh, and also the ability to investigate claims. So at the moment, a lot of the data from connected cars are kept with the OEMs, and they quite like it that way. Uh, having to share data willingly is going to be difficult, and making sure that the data is accessible but also be able to then manipulate that data, possibly with AI, is also going to take a lot of time. Next up, we have the automotive manufacturers themselves. Uh, we've heard a little bit about business models already, um, but they're going to have to do some more thinking in that space. And also keep an eye on the whole ecosystem as a whole. Um, there's always, always space for competitors and, and new entrants into this, into this space, if we, as we've seen recently. Uh, we'll also have to divide, develop industry-wide standards so that everyone is speaking the same language. So for that reason, they think it's surprisingly, because obviously the, autom the technology is what we hear about most, but people think it's going to be 13 years before automotive manufacturers are ready. And lastly, the regulators and legislations, they, they're the ones who, who really be able to make or break uh, the connected aut autonomous vehicle world. That they're the ones that need to be working with the government to make sure that it, there's a, a, a culture of competition uh, and also to be able to maintain the standards and attract the right types of uh, companies to, to, to the UK to use as a test bed. So they're, they're vital in the rollout of um, CAVs. And it's, our panel believe it's 11 years before that the regulators are actually be ready. So I've, I've given a, some time spans here for how long this, this may, may take. So how, we'd, how have, has PA done this? Well, we've, we've uh, developed a maturity matrix. Uh, it's based on the SAE J3016 for the taxonomy and definitions. Um, and, it's, and you won't be surprised it's based on five steps. But instead of applying it just to automotive technology, uh, we, with our panel, applied it to all of the areas that I just mentioned in that roadmap. And that covers law all the way through to uh, insurers. And using the same scale, you get a much better understanding of where each element lies in terms of its maturity. So number one is pretty obvious, nothing's happened, no real thought's been given. Number two is the exploratory thinking, discussions are starting to happen in, in whichever space that they're talking about. Um, they're having a rough idea of what capabilities needed. Number three, uh, the, some of the key building blocks are actually there to make uh, connected autonomous vehicles a reality. Some of the capabilities have been identified as well as some of the resources to make it happen, although nothing has actually started yet. Number four is our implementation is, is actually it's, it's starting. Certain things are in place, and you can see that progress is being made. And then obviously number five is, is full maturity. It's end-to-end. It's, -end. it's, it's all working, and it's seamless, and the capability is being realized. What I'll do today is I'll just focus on a few elements from our survey. Um, and the survey is available on the app uh, today to download. And I'll, I'll also give a link at the end of the um, at the end of my talk, but I'll just go into a few, few details to get into the depth of what our panel feel. So for the highways authorities themselves, 64% of our, our panel believe that we're in the exploratory and thinking phase. At least so it's good to know that things are starting. However, budgets, they're always going to be tight and that's going to, it's going to make it hard for local and national councils to plan, to plan ahead. And also the ability to support the 
uh, autonomous vehicles is also it's starting. But as examples, what happens at the moment if, if an autonomous vehicle would come up to a set of traffic lights? Would you have to be using a vision system to look at whether it's red, orange, or green? Or do you have to adapt every traffic light with Bluetooth type technology? The same with the, uh, the speed limits. Uh, and then you come into sort of the country roads. And this is part of what, an example of what PA does is we, we help to develop technology for, for clients and, and new applications. So if you're in a country road and you've got, it's a foggy day, the car's never been down that road before, how does that car know when to turn? How fast does it need to be? So having one thing we're developing is smart cat's eyes, which actually sends a signal to the vehicle which will tell it exactly when it needs to turn so then it stays on the road. So the recommendations for this space um, is to agree a long-term vision and then pinpoint the projects that help create the milestones to realize that vision with both national and local authorities. Next is the insurance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, being able to know how to charge a, a risk premium is going to be key. And 33% believe that not much thinking is actually thought gone into how claims will be sort of processed. And again, it comes back to being uh, able to have access to the data, being able to know what type of accident is caused by who or by what. Um, and so that's, that's going to be a real challenge. Also, the, the ability to assess risk. Uh, our panel believe that actually quite a lot of thinking is in this space. And the insurance company is uh, they're getting a bit of a head start in this area with the, with the sort of delivery of connected cars. So much so that even insurance companies are launching their own apps now. So you've got my app, my Aviva app, and also you've got uh, the More Than Smart Wheels box, which helps to lower premiums for, for younger drivers. And that's giving them a bit of an early heads up as to what's coming ahead. So the recommendations for this space were to really get to how, know how to get access to data from a, across the whole ecosystem, which would include like, the police, the vehicles themselves, and also analyze potential uses from sports to eco. Because if you've got a sports car and you take that off-road, how would that affect the insurance premium or not? And so all these things need to be thought through. The last example I've got um, is, actually I'll go skip past that one. The last one is the uh, automotive manufacturers. So uh, I mentioned earlier the business models. But um, a, lot, a lot of the panel believe that the uh, technology is already there in place. And it's great to know that some of the skills are being nurtured at the earlier levels because we really need to, to build on those skills because the automotive industry is going to become a lot more like the, uh, the IT and computer industry. It's going to be a lot more IT heavy, so it's, we definitely need more skills in that space. Upgrade of softwares is, is an interesting one, and actually that's probably one of the most furthest ahead. A brief example I've got is Tesla. Uh, they, had, they were potentially see, seeing a huge recall cost in some of their cars, because on the motorway, the, the car would hunker down and would rub a cable, which would cause a failure. Instead of recalling all the vehicles, Tesla sent out an over-the-air update to all the cars to push the car up two centimeters when it's at that speed, and hey presto, no more problem, no expensive recall. So that's going to be developing more and more. Then there's, then there's the ability to handle data and uh, cyber security, which, as I touched on earlier, you don't want to be locked in an autonomous vehicle and sent off a cliff. Um, and it, needs, it really is a very important element for for building customer confidence in this technology. So the recommendations from our panel in this perspective, again, is the, it's the National Skills Initiative to, to plug any gaps, standards for cybersecurity, and also the redesign of business models. So in conclusion, we, we probably won't see UK um, having autonomous vehicles for at least 10 years, possibly even 30. Um, but we're definitely a, a long way down the road. We've started, which is good. Um, but there's still a lot of different elements that need to come together for many, many different parties to make this actually happen. So I'll just leave with the foggy scene again and uh, the fact we're on our way to an exciting driverless future. And if you like any questions, we've got my email address and the, the report can be downloaded there or from the app. Thank <laughs> you.